Dennis is an associate professor at the University of Maryland's Department of Entomology and an internationally known honeybee epidemiologist. He graduated with a master's degree in apiculture at Guelph University, worked at the Canadian government as a consultant to the Antigua Beekeepers Cooperative in the West Indies. He returned north to work at Cornell University as an extension agent before working as the acting state apiarist for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania through a contract with Penn State University where he also earned his PhD. He has served as the president of the Apiary Inspections of America, is a founding member of the Colony Collapse Working Group, was a board member of haagen Ice Cream Bee Board, is a member of the Honey Bee Health Coalition, and was the founding president of the Bee Informed Partnership, Inc. Dennis has written extensively, has been widely interviewed, including Time Magazine, including the New York Times, Le Monde, The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, The New Yorker, Time, Fortune Magazine, People Magazine, Discover, Science News, Science Magazine, National Geographic Magazine, and Spiegel. Radio interviews include NPR, The Rutherford Show, ABC Radio, Wisconsin Public Radio, KPFA's Morning Show, and numerous local and regional news. Television includes Good Morning America, Fox News, 60 Minutes, CBC, PBS NewsHour, and documentary films include Silence of the Bees, The Last Beekeeper, Vanishing of the Bees, The Collectors. He has given well over 300 talks on beekeeping, including the French Parliament Agricultural Committee in Paris, the EU Parliament Commission on Colony Health in Brussels. Dennis has also done a TED Talk on bee losses. Good afternoon. At least it's the afternoon here in Maryland where I'm recording this. My name is Dennis Van Engelstorp, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Entomology. And I study honeybees, specifically risk factors that hurt managed honeybees. And of course, one of those risk factors is pesticides. When we think about what affects bees, we think of the three big P's, pesticides, or pesticides, pests and parasites, and poor nutrition. And I think it's true that all three play a role. Um, and one of the reasons we do the National Honeybee Disease Survey and APHIS, the arm of the US Gover USDA or the US Department of Agriculture that tries to protect bees from threats and all, all agriculture from threats, external threats, um, started doing the National Honeybee Disease Survey was to get an idea of what pests weren't here so that we knew what to protect against. And also to assess what risk factors bees are exposed to. And so we've, we, we, we do various tests. And at first we didn't include pesticides, but it was um, really the conviction of Robin Rose, who worked at APHIS at the time and, and sort of helped direct the bee program at APHIS. She really wanted pesticides to be included. And so we started taking samples of pesticide or of pollen um, then we've, we've changed to wax for a while and we're going back to pollen um, and bee bread from colonies to sort of figure out, well, what is out there in the beehives in the nation? And, and, and can we somehow look at these levels and associate them with impacts at the colony level at this very high level of apiary, taking an apiary snapshot? And I want to share those results with you about the pesticides in this brief um, talk and lecture. I want to forewarn you, though, that I am not a toxicologist. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bee scientist. I'm not a toxicologist. A lot of these names are long and foreign to me, and I have to look them up to understand them. 
But I think what I can do here, not being a toxicologist, is trying to frame this in ways that I understand from the perspective of a bee scientist. And maybe if you're a beekeeper, um, it might also help you understand what it means. So we take an apiary level sample. We sample eight colonies in an apiary and we put all those samples together and we try to collect three grams of bee bread for this study. Um, we pooled all of the eight um, hives together. Um, so per hive, that's about four cells of fresh pollen. We really looked for the fresh pollen, not the, the bee bread that you know is all honeyed and, and preserved. We really wanted fresh pollen in order to minimize the amount of time that anything in there could have degraded. Um, we did 10 samples per state. We usually sample 24 call, um, apiaries per state. Um, this is a very expensive process. Um, 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 and so we can't do all the samples, as many, all the samples um, like we do for the diseases. Um, this represents samples from 39 states and Puerto Rico. And so it is a broad overview of, of colonies across the continental United States. And we did this sampling from 2011-2017 with about a thousand samples um, and we collected them all year round um, and you can get this, you can interact with this data if you want to go to the Be Informed website. Um, under APHIS we have this data in ways that you can look at it too while still protecting the identity of the people who contributed the samples. And so here we are collecting the bee bread or the pollen. You can see this is freshly packed pollen. And so they'll collect that in these vials and those vials then get sent to the lab, stored at, 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 in freezing until we can send them to a lab in North Carolina, a federal pesticide lab. It's the same lab that does all the pesticide screening of fruits and vegetables. And so it's a, it's a, very, it's a very high throughput and well-recognized chemical diagnostic lab, especially when it comes to pesticides. So when we get, when we get samples back, um, there's lots of ways of thinking about well, what, what do these results mean? So one simple, of course, is yes, no, right? Like, is this pesticide here or is it not? And so from that, we can calculate prevalence, the percentage of samples that have a chemical or don't have a product. Another way we can do it is, well, how many different chemicals do we find in a sample? And we call this diversity. So these are themes that we're going to see over and over in the talk, where we talk about each one of these themes and how that relates to how we understand pesticides in the hive. Um, the other one is how much quantity is there, like how many parts per million of this foreign substance is there. You can have something that's not very toxic and you can have a lot, a lot of in there. So if there's a lot, lot in there, does that have some risk? So we talk about the concentration, the pesticide concentration. Now, modern detection levels are able to really look at very minute amounts of product, like one drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. And so the question is, is, well, just because you see it, does it have an effect? And so can we put in a threshold that we say, look, we're only going to consider as part of this hazard quote, which is a way of summarizing the risk in one number, we're only going to consider pesticides if they reach a certain threshold, that they at least obtain a level that there's a slight chance it might hurt the insect, that it's not so low it's hard to understand how it could possibly have a negative consequence. And so we call that the positive 50 HQ because we say, okay, if it has a, high, a, a HQ score of 50 or more, we include it. And I'll explain where we come up with that 50 in a bit. And then we just calculate the hazard quotient. What is the hazard quotient? When we put all the products together and we try to balance it for risk, what does that mean? So we've, we're trying to understand risk by looking at different ways that we think it might hurt bees. Here you can see when we sampled, you can see we're certainly biased in September and October sampling. And that's just a function of when apiary inspectors get there. Um, um, and so that's important that it's not, um, uh, 
it's not evenly distributed and so we're, we're biased and so it could be that there are other things happening at other times of the year that we're not capturing adequately so pesticide prevalence this is quite amazing right like the darker the red the more closer you are to 100 percent infected like that every sample and you can see there's a lot of places that approach 100 percent um, um, and, and, and some that are, you know, approaching 50%, but certainly there's a lot of places where there's a lot of pesticides. So this is just yes or no, are they in there? And if we look over time, what you can see is all pesticides, there's no significance, but we've seen the, the incidence of insecticides decrease over time, where the, there's been an increase of fungicides over time. The other two aren't significant with the herbicides and rosicides. So we've seen more and more fungicides, it looks like, and less and less insecticides. We can look at diversity. What you can see is in, in, in North Dakota and California, two big ag states, um, there's a lot of number of different products per sample. Um, for the rest of the country, it tends to be below three. If we look at, so here, we have a histogram of the number of samples that had different levels of pesticide. So if we look at the bottom here, what you can see is this is the number of pesticides found, and this is the number of samples. So we have zero here, and so you can see that about 20% of all samples had no pesticides detected. That means that 80% of samples had at least one sample detected. On average, there are two different products in a sample, or three if you exclude the zeros. So between two and three different products per sample. If we look at um, the class and diversity of all detections, you can see that by far and large, the product we see most are the varroacides. Followed by the insecticide, or followed by the fungicides and insecticides, both at just 21, 22%, and then herbicides. Now, insecticides, that's a lot of insecticides because insecticides, of course, kill insects and bees are insects, so that's worrying that we have so much of that. And the fungicides, we don't usually think of fungicides as posing a risk for bees, but as I'll show you, there's increasing evidence that that might not be correct. So if we look now at the concentration of pesticides, how many parts per million are there in a sample? Again, you can see there's quite a bit of diversity here, much more so than the other measures of risk, with some states having very low concentrations of pesticides, even though you find them and, and they're diverse, but they're at low concentrations. But again, California, New York, and some of these other states um, especially these ag states, tend to have a lot of product in them. And so what's, 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 what's going on there is a good question. So when we look at, well, what products are we finding at very high concentrations? What we find is that a lot of those are fungicides. Um, now, that makes a little bit of sense because unlike insecticides, there's no label law that says you should um, not spray fungicides on blooming crops. In fact, some of the fungicides are meant to be sprayed on crops when they're blooming. And so it's not a surprise that we see these high levels. However, we're increasingly seeing evidence that high levels of fungicides are tied with increasing number of queen events. And we know that queen events are a very good predictor of increased risk of colony mortality. So a colony that has a, has a queen event is three times more likely to die than a colony that doesn't. And we know that the exposure to fungicides increases the chances that a colony will have a queen event. So one of the things we really struggle with about 
figuring out how to assess the risk in a sample that has more than one pesticide um, is what is that what is that effect how, how do those things add up and so one way of doing that is to calculate the hazard quotient and so we can calculate the hazard quotient by taking how much pesticide is in a sample or the dose and divide it in by a screening benchmark, which we'll say is the LD50, or 50% 50 of the population of bees, if they were fed that amount of food with that concentration, would die. We then have to think about that in terms of, well, what's important for a bee? And so we have to figure out, well, how much does a bee eat of this pollen? And what happens if they're exposed, and they eat this pollen for 10 days, because that's how long they eat pollen. So what concentration matters, considering all that? And then we have to build in a safety factor, which is we use 10%, because that's what EPA uses for, for other food measurements. And so what that allows us to do is come up with thresholds, where we think there may be some concern. And so here what we can do is that an HQ value of 1,000 means that it's 10% of the lethal dose at 50%. So that means that a bee would need to eat that every day for 10 days before the, they had 50% chance of dying from the pesticide, considering that they're not detoxifying or anything. So it's a very conservative level. When it's below a thousand, we don't think that it, it's hard to imagine it's going to be very harmful for bees just because it, it, it's, it's just such a low amount. If it's a thousand, it's not likely that it's going to cause harm alone, but maybe it synergizes with other factors. Maybe like if the colony is sick with Varroa, this is going to make it problematic. And then we have uh, over a thousand, you can't rule out that it's going to be toxic. So here's an example of how you can calculate that. We have three products, we add them together, and we come up with a score. Now, this is the problem with this system. This is the limitation, is that we are assuming that two pesticides, when they're together, have an additive effect. But we know that there are a lot of pesticides that synergize, where one plus one does not equal two, where you have one product and another product, and, they, and the combination is much more toxic than the two combined. And there are efforts underway to figure out how to incorporate that complexity. So there's this is limited, but it's our best attempt. Here you can see there's three products, but one, which is a, a, a neonic, is very high concentrations. And so uh, very low concentrations, but it's highly toxic. And so we really get a high hazard quotient score. So one of the things we can do is say 50. If it is lower than 50, which again is half a percent of that, that toxic load, let's not consider it. And so if you look at that then and pesticide diversity, you can see it really shifts. It shifts to these states that are high fruit and vegetable states. Um, so in most places, most of the pesticides we're detecting are not at high concentrations. And then what we can see is that instead of varroicides being the predominant, it's insecticides. And so when we find insecticides, they tend to be at doses that we think are problematic. Hazard quotient scores, without coincidence, also follow that. When we have highly toxic products in a sample, we're going to have higher ha hazard quotient scores. So this gives you a, a different perspective of what's happening in terms of affecting these. And so then if we look at, well, what are the pesticides that are causing the most problem? A couple come to mind. You can see that a couple here come to mind. We have a lot of insecticides. Um, especially some of these neonicotinoids, which when we find can be really problematic. We don't find them often, but when we find them, they're problematic. We also find a lot of varroicides. It's interesting to note that when there's a lot of th um, thymol or fluvalinate in a colony, mite levels tend to be high. And we're not sure that this is because it's a treatment failure or whether this is because they're treating while we take the samples and it hasn't killed all the mites yet. 
One of the things we do see, however, though, is that each one of these different measures, HQ score, um, concentration, diversity, prevalence, when we look at nosema, when we look at nosema above a million spores per B, that's pretty well consistently that each one of these is a measure of risk. And so nosema often is a really good indication that there's some other stress factor occurring and that seems to correlate with, with, with pesticides as well. We also look for brood diseases and we did find that we found brood diseases commonly in these apiaries and we found that when we had fungicides in samples, those apiaries were much more likely to be positive for um, brood diseases, especially chalk brood. And so we had four times the rate of, of, of chalk brood in apiaries that had fungicide exposure. So what, how do, let's pack this all together. What's the summary of our findings? Not all pollen samples are contaminated. 18% are pesticide free. Um, for the pesticides we detected, and we didn't detect all of them, that's too expensive, um, um, but we over 260 different products were tested for. Only 5.4% of those were above a threshold of 1,000. So when we find pesticides, not a lot of them have levels that we think are a concern for the bees. But still 6%, 5%, that's still a lot. Um, we're seeing that some pesticides are increasing over time, especially pesticide use and fungicide use. And we're concerned about the number of insecticides that we're finding. Um, and while neonics weren't found very often when they were found they seem to be at levels that we certainly think could pose a risk to those colonies um, fungicides is a tricky issue and we really have to start looking at fungicides in a different way there seems to be some real sub-lethal effects associated with fungicides so you can seem to have a bee walk through, like swim through fungicides and live. But it seems at the colony level, um, something's going on. Maybe it's disrupting their biota or something, but something negative is going on because of fungicide infection. So I think that summarizes um, the pesticide survey. I have to thank my lab. I have a great lab and keeping track of all of these different samples is not easy. Um, um, and keeping track of the money is not easy um, and keeping track of the apiary inspectors isn't easy and of course we have to thank the apiary inspectors too across the country who go out and take these samples for us and collect this data um, in order for us to produce this so good morning well at least it's morning here in Maryland where I'm recording this talk my name is Dennis Van Elstorp and I'm an assistant professor at the university no i'm an associate professor at the university of maryland and i study honeybee health and in this talk today i'm really excited to talk about this 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 talk today um as i think it's some of the most practical work we've done um with the bn partnership um who certainly have and continue to lead these efforts I think it's. I think what I'm about to present is um, is 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 meant to be very practical. Um, and before I do that, though, I want to explain how we came up with the sort of findings that I'll share with you. Um, I want to remind or or put into context the fact that this project is part of a bigger process, which is to try to implement the public health model to improve bee health. And so to do that, we have to define the problem. We have to figure out what's causing the problem or what can prevent the problem. We have to try to figure out how to solve those problems. And then we have to try to get people to do them and then evaluate if it works or not. And so this is part of that continuum. And central to that continuum is the loss survey. We need to know 
what outcome? We want to say, okay, did you do this and did you do that? And did you have an outcome? And the outcome of interest is our winter loss for what I'm going to be presenting today. Um, again, we probably need to reconsider this. If we look at the loss rate we've experienced across the country from 2008 to 2020, the blue line indicates winter loss. And you can see it has fluctuated. It's really, it really was extreme um, last year, nearly as 40%. Um, and, and, and it's averaging around 30% or just under 30%, which is a high loss of rate. You'll note, too, that we started summer loss recording in 2011. And predictably, as what we would have thought, was it was lower than winter loss. You can see it's sort of an approach sometimes and sometimes surpassed. Summer losses have surpassed. And this last year, summer losses really surpassed our winter losses. And so colonies are dying all the time. And what drives summer losses could be very different than winter losses. And that's important when I'm talking about what I talk about today, because I'm specifically talking about winter losses, those losses for us in the United States that occur between October and April. Now, part of that winter loss and summer loss survey is an optional management survey. And this management survey has been led by Natalie Steinhauer, who is who was one of my first PhD students and is now the head of the Be Informed Partnerships. Um, she's the science officer for the Be Informed Partnership. And she's a brilliant statistician, and it really did require someone who had a statistical brilliance to figure out how to do this. Because you all know that you get five beekeepers together and you get seven opinion and six are right. And, 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 and so there's lots of different ways of keeping bees, you know, bees, you know, the only thing more interesting than beekeepers are bees themselves, right? Like beekeepers are pretty interesting. They do a whole bunch of different things. They try a whole bunch of different ways. And what we wanted to do was sort of try to think of everything that we thought beekeepers could do to their hives, put it in a survey, and then objectively try to figure out well, which practices matter, which practices don't, and which ones do you really want to get. Basically, we want to get best management practices. And so to do this, um, over 72 different management criteria we, we asked a lot of questions about. And then Natalie came up with a model. Now this is a terrible slide to give a group like this because like who can understand this? But I think that there is a, a couple of important things to highlight here. First of all, I want to say that there are different, be best practices are different for different kinds of beekeepers. These are all the beekeepers in the country. This is northern beekeepers that are backyard beekeepers, southern backyard beekeepers, migratory or stationary commercial beekeepers, and migratory commercial beekeepers. And we found that what was good for some is different than was good for others. Let me explain that. So one of the things that we can do is we have these 72 different criteria. And what we want to do is we want to come up with an index. We want to say this is the perfect management system. And then what we can do is we can say to the model, OK, if you take if, if I don't feed my bees, let's take that randomly out of the equation. Does that make my model better or does it make it worse? And we measure whether it makes it better or worse is if it decreases the P value or increases it. If it increases it, that means that ugh, you don't need that management practice. It made the model worse. If it decreased it, it says, no, keeping that, 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 that into the model is important because it improves the model. So we can do this tens of thousands of times. And then we can say, well, how many times was each treatment or each activity kept in the model? And so what you'll see is that there are some activities that were never kept in any models. So they probably weren't important at all. And then we have a bunch of, of treatments that were always in the model. And then we have, like when you see a big confidence interval like this, then they're sometimes in the model and they're sometimes not in the model. It's sort of all over the place. So there's a lot of variability. But you can see we can quickly identify these practices that are critical to make the to, to, to predict the highest level of success compared to 
average beekeeping practice. And so what were those top five ranks? We're only going to talk about the top five ranks here. And, 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 and some of these are surprising, and I'm going to go through details here. I know that this is a, a conversation to the New Zealand beekeepers. And so very specifically, I'm going to talk about um, um, sideline and commercial beekeepers, because I think that's who most of this audience is. Um, but I want to illustrate this a little with the, the, the backyard beekeepers for a moment, because I think that there's some things to be learned from that. And so one of the things that really surprised us about these backyard beekeepers was one of the best predictors, one of the things that they, the best things they could do was their action on dead outs. When you come across a dead colony, you have two options, right? One option is you can pack it up and take it home and, you know, feel sorry for yourself. Or when you're in the field, you split it in half. You that take that dead colony, you put it on a live colony, get the bees in there, you make a split so that you're continuously using the comb. Consistently, we found that people who do continuous splits or are always using their comb have lower losses than those who take the dead outs home and split later on at some point. Now, I want to say that this is correlative data and it is not causation. It could very well be that the people who take the bees home just remember better than the people who are splitting all the time, right? Because they had to take them home and they count them better. Um, but this is a really consistent pattern. And I don't understand. I don't think anyone understands it. Natalie thinks that it's ridiculous and, and, and really doesn't sh isn't sure how we should promote it. And we really have to be careful with how we frame that argument. But it's still the data. And I think it's important that we say that that keeps coming up in our survey. And that's a surprise. Whether you treated Varroa, there's lots of that. That's of course critical. How you started new colleagues was important. Um, how you called comb and, and and sort of when you used it. But there are these consistent themes. I'm going to concentrate here um, on the larger scale beekeepers for a minute. The first thing I want to say though before I do that is you'll notice that um, there are some pretty consistent, clear best advantages when we look at backyard beekeepers only. For commercial beekeepers, however, you'll notice that these 95% these confidence intervals are all over the place. It's not as clean cut as it is for backyard beekeepers. And that's probably because you have to look at beekeeping operations, especially the larger ones, on an individual basis because there's so much variety. We don't also don't have as much data because there aren't as many of these beekeepers, but it also is so attuned to specific um, operations. And so again, that's important to think about when I provide or talk through some of these results, because um, especially for commercial beekeepers, it's like you need to work with them one-on-one -on -one to try to identify the factors that might improve their, their management score, which we know is directly related to our loss score. So the first one is how you start new colonies and consistently People who split their colonies, increase, make increases by splitting, lose fewer colonies than those who do not. Similarly, people who use packages to replace lose colonies, lose more colonies than those who do not. And so you can see um, that for these other things too. So basically splitting tends to correlate with higher survivorship and those who are using packages exclusively tends to look at lower survivorship. The next one is honey production. And this is sort of a ridiculous one because you don't have control over honey production, right? But, 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 but this isn't a surprise either. If you have a good honey year, your bees are good and they're happy. They tend to be fat for the winter and you have good survivorship. If it's been a crappy summer and there's no honey and there's no pollen, well, your bees don't fare as well. So that makes sense. It makes sense that it comes up in this in, in, uh, as an equation here, um, and it makes sense, but there's not a lot you can do with that, of course. The next is Varroa monitoring techniques. And this is a call out because we ask, how do you look for Varroa? And, and, and there was a clear benefit that if you were part of a team, like one of the tech, BIP tech transfer teams, 
where you're paying an outside service to come in and survey your bees, that these people did better than those who didn't. And that's because if you think about it, the times you need to sample your bees are exactly the time in, it's exactly the time of year when you don't have time to sample your bees. And so having someone else there that is, that's their duty, they have to go out and they do it at the most inconvenient times, but it gets you the information you need quickly so it's actionable right away. And I think that that's why we're seeing that those who, who, who are using tech teams, I don't think it's anything necessarily specifically about who those tech team members are. I think every commercial beekeeper should have a, someone assigned to the fact that their primary and first duty is to monitor for mites and you should have that in the system. And that person is going to be monitoring mites when you'd rather have them extracting or pulling honey. Um, but I think you need to have that discipline to get maximized success. Winter prep ended up being important here. One of the things that is going on, and I suggest if you guys are interested in this, there's a lot of great work coming out of Washington State in this um, indoor wintering. Um, and uh, you can see that moving indoors was successful, as was equalizing. And of course, equalizing the very famous beekeeping, uh, beekeeping scientist Farah said, you know, take your winter losses in the fall. And that's good advice, right? Like if your colonies are four frames, you merge those before the winter. Um, and so equalizing colonies by merging the weak colonies is a good practice. So you can see that these five um, different criteria there. Um, one of the, 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 the things though is that this is theory, right? Like this was correlation. And so we have to then take it from correlation to proof. And in order to do that, what we wanted to do was we wanted to say, okay, let's implement this. Let's take some colonies, let's implement best practices in half of them, and then average practices for half of them. And average practices is a very important thing to consider because there are things you notice that haven't come up here, like um, 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 time of year for varroa treatment, or did you feed for did you feed sugar to your colonies? And that's because nearly all beekeepers did it or all beekeepers did something. And so that was part of average practices. And so to do this experiment, we did best practices and we did average practices, but we did, if there was nothing mentioned about feeding, we just managed them like the average beekeeper did or like we would normally do in that apiary. It was only when that there were these specific things. So we, our varroa treatment, what we decided to do is that any time it exceeded our threshold of three, we would treat. We would, after the first year, only use packages for our average practices, because that's what the average beekeeper did. And we would only use splits or nukes, um, preferring splits, if um, it was in best practices. When a colony died and it was in average practices, we brought it home and made the package introduction the next year. If it was in our best practices, we would split and continuously use the comb. And if we did have a dead out and we did have to bring comb home um, in our best practices, because sometimes you just can't split, so you have to bring stuff home. In our best practices, we would freeze that. And in our average practices, we would not. So that was our, our, our protocol um, in terms of our two practices. And then we implemented this, and this was a collaboration between a whole bunch of universities in different states, um, um, in Minnesota, in Oregon, uh, in, and so all over the, the country, we got really good buy-in with a couple of B labs to, to do these field tests. And this was um, led by Kelly Kahulnik, who's now at Washington State. And this is what we found. This was really quite amazing. This is our mortality rate, right? So the, 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 the dashed line is our winter loss and the, 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 the solid bar is our summer loss and our orange is average and our blue, B, blue is best. So you can see that in the first year after packages, we had really high losses, which isn't surprising after packages on foundation here in Maryland, especially in a lot of these colonies were in Maryland is you had really high losses, no difference between the groups. 2017, 
Again, average and best practices implemented now for over a year. You can see it's still not difference, but there seems to be a difference. But by 2018, the accumulation of all these different treatment effects, we lost a lot fewer colonies than we did in the best practices than average. But it took three years to realize this difference. And so that does really suggest that a lot of our practices are cumulative and we know this right like you know you start preparing your bees for the winter in the spring and and but it seems like there's also this connection from season to season a connection between how good your bees are this year to um, or to how you treat your bees this year to how they'll be next year another thing we did with that project was assess it for um, um, the economy so we worked with an economist and what we found was that, in fact, a lot more honey was produced um, in the second year in our best practices. And in fact, by year three, you were making three times more money in the best practices than you were in average practices. So that all comes together to say that 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 the best practices work um, according to our theory. And when we tested it in the field over a three year trial, we found that they did in fact work, but it took three years for that positive impact to be dealt or to be felt. And so that's interesting. Now, there is a way of exploring each different management practices and the results for each region or for the whole country at one time. Um, because this is a talk with uh, uh, beekeepers in New Zealand, um, and we don't have survey data from New Zealand, I, I, I thought I'd pull out the Pacific Northwest data because I think that's closest to your data. And, and you can go to the, 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 the beinformed.org website and look this information up yourself. And this will allow you to compare different treatment methods. So for instance, here, what you can see is that this is the loss rate for backyard beekeepers, sideline beekeepers, and commercial beekeepers in Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. And what we can do is, this is important, so this blue line then is the average, the mean, and this black line here is the confidence interval. So it's the 95% confidence interval. This is different than a standard error, which you may have seen before, but 95% confidence interval. The way to read confidence intervals, it's not anything surprising, is that if these confidence intervals overlap, there is no difference. Or a statistical difference and if they don't overlap there's a statistical difference so here what we can say is that this is people who either did or did not use any known varroa mite control treatment over the course of the year and we see those who did lost significantly fewer than those who didn't in the idaho and washington or in, in the pacific northwest and then you we also can compare that by the national averages below Here we can look at, 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 at individual, um, individual treatments. So we have Amitraz, um, and you can see that there, there's a large confidence interval here. That means there was a lot of variability in the data and probably not many people answering the question. Um, and so you can see that the Washington average here, people who used Amitraz lost a lot fewer than those who reported they didn't. However, when we look at Apigard and Apolifar, you notice that Apigard has this really wide confidence interval and it overlaps, so we can't say these are statistically different. When we look at the national average, you can say we can say that they're different, and that's of course because we have more people responding. And so sometimes that confidence interval is a result of the lack of respondents. The more respondents you have, generally the smaller the confidence interval becomes. And so you can see the same for Apolifar. Um, Kumafos, no one's using Kumafos in the, in the Pacific Northwest, and certainly on nationally, those who are using it are losing just the same as those who aren't. And so indication that Kumafos is not working. The same for fluvalinate, I think, um, and formic acid tends to do better. Um, now, I, I can go through all of these practices, but I don't think that that's what we want, want to do. I think you guys can do that yourself. Um, we go through all practices like fumagillin use, nosema prevention, um, antibiotic use. We also look at some of the not 
um, chemical controls, we look at feeding practices, we look at types of feed, types of protein, um, and so there's all the things you can think of as management we've done and tried to compare it so you can go in there and play with the data yourself and compare these averages and I encourage you to do that. Okay, I think I'm coming to the end of this. Um, thank you for listening. Um, thank you to all the people who make this happen. I've got a great lab. I've got great funders and great collaborators. Um, and I hope you have found this useful. I think we're going to enter into a question and answer period now. So I'll, I'll be interested to hear your questions and thoughts. Thank you very much.